All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Science Never Stops with the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. My name is David Weichel, and I'm the Planetarium Director at the Intuitive Planetarium. And tonight we're going to be talking all about black holes. So I hope you're all very well and staying safe and staying home and all those good things. And while we're waiting for a um, few people to uh, notice our stream here, um, how about a quick uh, chime in for all of you and tell me where you're watching from tonight. All right, so I'll start. I'm in Huntsville, Alabama. Fantastic, I know. We would love for you to come visit us when all of this is, is said and done. Let's see. All right, so uh, to begin, what you're looking at right here is a black hole. And it's not um, a black hole that we've taken a picture of. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, what, you're, what you're looking at is a simulation of a black hole. Okay, cool, now we're, we have some people chiming in, fantastic. Um, hello to Anna Elizabeth from Atlanta. Hello to Sarah from New Jersey. Todd from Kentucky with Elizabeth, fantastic. Welcome, welcome. Um, Carrie from Birmingham, very cool. So uh, again, what I was saying, uh, this this picture that we're looking at right in here is not um, an image that we have taken, uh, but rather this is a picture that is uh, a simulation and one that is um, highlighting the, the very strange um, optics that we see with a black hole. Uh, we're going to get into some of the, the technical capability of this, but first I want to answer the, some of the questions of uh, what a black hole even is. And so to do that, I'm going to uh, bring up, I'm actually going to uh, get rid of uh, that right in there, and I'm going to uh, go into our planetarium software, which is called Digistar, and we're going to jump into that here. I'm juggling many tabs, so bear with me for a moment. As we jump into that, very cool. Okay, so we're going to get started taking a look um, at the Earth here. Okay, so everyone hopefully can see that. Very cool. And as we zoom away from the Earth, it's important to realize that gravity is something that we're all very familiar with, right? It's something that we experience every day and you're experiencing right now. Gravity is this force that pulls you down to the Earth. And uh, while that's the sort of simple aspect of it, it's a lot more than that, right? Um, gravity is the mutual attraction between any two objects in the solar system. In the universe, any two objects that have mass are gravitationally attracted to each other. And so anywhere that there is mass, and somewhere else that there's mass, there is some sort of attraction. So you are actually attracted to the person sitting next to you, gravitationally at least. Um, you are attracted to your chair, for example. You're attracted to the Earth, of course. That's something that uh, you experience um, very, very specifically. Let's uh, bring up some planetary orbits for you in here. There we go. Oh, bring them back for you. Very cool. Um, the Earth, of course, is attracted to the Sun, but actually the Earth is attracted back to you. These are, these are a mutual attraction. So anyway, with a black hole, a, the black hole is so, 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 so massive that gravity is so, 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 so strong that as you are approaching a black hole and get too close to the black hole, the speed that you would need to leave said black hole is incredibly fast. So when we try to leave the Earth, right, we can't just jump off of the Earth. We have to take a rocket and travel very fast. Well, a black hole, the speed that you would need to leave is quite literally faster than the speed of light. And so, since the speed of light is the speed limit of the universe, you can't escape. Nothing can escape, because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. 
So a black hole is literally a place that has such a strong gravitational pull in the surrounding area that nothing within that, the bounds of that very strong pull can escape because nothing can travel that fast. Uh, it's pretty much that straightforward. So let me toggle back here. I need about 18 uh, different monitors for all the screens I have um, that I'm working with. Uh, let's see. So Elizabeth says, my son would like to know, could there be a wormhole inside a black hole that leads to the under, other end of the universe? Uh, well, wow, that's a complicated question to answer. And uh, my, my short answer for you is, uh, maybe, possibly. Um, my more complicated answer is, uh, I, don't, I don't know. And no one else really knows either. Um, mathematically, these things could be possible, perhaps. Um, but certainly difficult, so so I don't know. I guess my advice, uh, Elizabeth, to your son would be this is an op uh, excellent opportunity uh, for something for him to study growing up um, if he's interested in those sorts of things, and, and we need that sort of thing. So uh, I'm going to keep uh, cruising away here right now from our solar system because we need to get to something um, far away and very, very prominent. I need to show you what a black hole looks like. So we're going to head outside of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Now, our galaxy does have a black hole in it, at least one, probably very, very many. Um, Sagittarius A, and let's see, uh, can you see my cursor? I'll find out here shortly. So. Sagittarius A star uh, is right in the center here. Good, you can't see my cursor. So we do have a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And uh, let me show you what that looks like. So I'll bring that up. And we're going to uh, fly there right now. Um, spoiler alert, this might be uh, quite, quite, quite bright. So we'll see. Ooh, it is quite, quite bright. Uh, also, caveat that I, while we have done some live streams, we've never used um, our planetarium software in flat screen mode prior to about 2 a.m. last night. Uh, so this is all uh, very much on the fly and fairly exciting. Okay, so this is, this is a black hole right in here and looking a little bit funky, and we got really close in flat screen mode. So let's, let's move out just a bit. Okay. So um, what we're seeing in here, and let's, uh, let me pause outside of this and see if I can make this a touch dimmer for you. Okay, so what we're seeing right in here is this black area that is quite literally the bounds of the black hole. Um, this is the, the region of space that is incredibly, incredibly dense, incredibly massive, and as a result, um, does not allow any light to escape. Now, there is a very bright region around this, and that's because we're at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And because the Milky Way is so, so bright, let me bring down its intensity a little bit. Oh, maybe too much. Let's bring it down right about in here. Because, because uh, we have so many stars around it, uh, it's actually very hard for us uh, to get a good view of this, but because there are so many stars around it, we're able to see these weird gravitational effects uh, that are exhibited around the black hole. So we can see, I'll bring my cursor back up in here and slow down our, our rotation. Uh, you can see this sort of weird uh, arcing shape in here and this strange stretching of light going on. So the dark area, again, is uh, this is the event horizon. This is where the point of no return where uh, light can't escape, you couldn't escape, all these fun sorts of things. In here, the brighter area, this is called the accretion disk. This is material that is falling into this black hole. Uh, hasn't fallen in yet, though. That's why we can still see it. And it's very, very bright because next to a black hole, you're getting very squished. All this material is getting very crunched uh, together by very, very, very strong gravitational pull. And so the result of this um, is lots and lots and lots of energy. And this heats things up very much. Uh, they produce lots of light. And that's what we can see, um, sometimes invisible light. Um, but uh, in this case, if we're observing these sorts of things, it would be like an x-ray um, from the Earth. But uh, a nice representation here. And it is spinning around uh, because things in space 
um, are essentially never still, uh, at least compared to something. And the to conserve angular momentum, you can see that it's spinning uh, faster when it's closer, slower when it's farther away. And this is analogous to a figure skater that is spinning around with its arms really wide and then pulls them in tight to go a little bit faster. Now, backing away from the black hole and looking at the weird shape of the accretion disk, this is what's sort of funky. And we can see all these stars sort of bending out of the way. Because gravity is so, so, so strong here, gravity has this strange uh, ability to warp the fabric of space and time itself. And that's a very complicated thing to understand. So what's happening, uh, essentially, is that think of all of space, three dimensions that you can wave your hands around in, and time that we're sort of moving forward in as we speak, and all the time. Um, imagine that two-dimensionally as a bed sheet, uh, which isn't a perfect analogy, but, but works for our cases here. Imagine that as a bed sheet that we have dropped you know, a few marbles on. Um, maybe those are planets, right? Um, or maybe even the sun. Maybe they're different stars. Drop something maybe bowling ball sized on it. And you can imagine that instead of a little dip with a marble, you get sort of a big a big bend. Um, a, quite a big dip. Well, in a similar way, black holes are bending space and time together in this very uh, strange sense. And so the path that light is traveling through space and time to our eyes, if it's behind this black hole or near this black hole, is going to be bent and warped and strange. So we call this gravitational lensing. And it's really neat in a lot of ways, and there's a lot of great applications for it. It also looks super weird. Now, back to the accretion disk, you can see that it looks like it's above and below the black hole from our perspective. Um, but what is actually happening is this is light above and, or rather behind the black hole in both cases. And this light right in here is the light that's in front of the black hole uh, from our perspective. So if we zoom into this a little bit, and I'll move my cursor so it doesn't have that uh, label on it, you can see that the accretion disk itself from sort of arbitrarily above is quite, quite flat, quite disk shaped. And it's only when we're sort of on plane with this accretion disk that we get uh, this sort of strange effect in here. And so because gravity is warping space and time so dramatically, it appears as though we have light above and below this black hole, but really it is behind it, and that light is being bent over it and underneath this black hole to reach our eyes, because that's the shortest path through space. So very funky. Um, you, you learn in school that uh, the shortest distance between two lines uh, or two points is a straight line, right? Well, in this case, the straight line is sort of around the black hole. Super weird. Uh, so we have another question of what happens to planets when they fall into a black hole? And that's a great segue. And um, the, the good news for you um, is that you don't have to worry because planets are not going to fall into a black hole, or at least our planets are not going to fall into a black hole. Uh, but let's take a look at um, a scenario where this could get a little bit uh, uh, sticky, for example. So let's take a look at a star. Um, as an aside, I was planning this presentation, I thought, wow, you know, I don't know that I have enough content to talk more than maybe five minutes. And here we go. So now we're getting, getting rolling, and this is lots of fun. So now, um, what we're looking at here, and uh, a little bit a little bit big, is a star that has a companion in here, which happens to be a black hole. So this could have formed in a, a variety of manners, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but this black hole is actually hanging out with this star and sort of stealing material from it. And the reason that we're going in this direction of to answer the question, what happens to planets when they fall into a black hole, is that you'll notice that the star is not falling into the black hole itself, right? It's not just zooming into the black hole. 
So we can see the, the big star right in here, the black hole with the accretion disk, these weird jets of radiation um, spewing away, which is due to strong magnetic fields. You can see that gravitational lensing to just a little bit of an effect. And the, the point is that you don't just fall into a black hole because gravity works the same whether you're a black hole or not. Gravity just happens to be very, very strong, very, very close to a black hole. But you can have a black hole with the mass of the sun, for example. It would just mean that, and actually anything can be a black hole if you make it small enough. So for example, if you took the Earth and you smushed it into something that had the radius of about a centimeter, it would become a black hole. If you smushed you into something that was incredibly tiny, the size of a pinhead perhaps, um, you could become a black hole. If you took the sun and crushed it into the size of a city, uh, keeping in mind that the sun normally is about, uh, could fit 1,300,000 Earths inside of it, then it could be a black hole. So gravity would stay the same, and if the sun became a black hole, which it can't, uh, or, or not easily at least, um, if the sun was to become a black hole, nothing would change for us as far as our orbit on the Earth and all the other planets. We just wouldn't have a nice light source, a heat source, and we'd get, you know, cold and dark and die but uh, we wouldn't fall in, so that's okay um, for now, I guess. We have other problems to worry about right now. Um, anyway, so I guess the que to answer the question definitively, what would happen to a planet if you fell into a black hole? It would go away. You would never see it again. It would get ripped apart gravitationally in the process, and that's sort of the weird thing and the exciting thing that would happen. So as you're falling into a black hole, you are going to experience gravity in uh, sort of almost like stages of intensity, right? So right now on the Earth, your feet are actually being pulled with more ferocity towards the Earth than your head is, assuming you're standing or sitting and not doing a handstand or something. Um, it's not noticeable to you, but this is the case. And if you were falling feet first into a black hole, you would have a... Um, you would have a, a weird similar scenario, but it would be very perceptible. So your feet would experience gravity much more strongly the closer you get, and your head would experience it um, you know, more slowly. And so as your feet are falling forward and they get more strongly pulled than your head, you're actually going to get stretched and elongated into miles long thin version of you. Um, and a planet would experience something similar. So you can expect to get basically pulled apart and this process is called spaghettification, and that is the technical term, which is awesome. Um, so you'd be turned into a giant piece of spaghetti, and a planet would too, but it would sort of crumble in the process. Um, also, on top of that, you would have sort of a mess because the other material falling in with you at the same time is very, very hot. Uh, lots and lots of radiation when, um, at a subatomic level, protons and electrons are getting really smushed together, and that's sort of a mess too. They get very angry about that, and so the, the process of that would be, um, you know, pretty, pretty brutal. All that radiation is not good for you. Um, imagine getting x-rayed many, many times at the dentist office in a row. Uh, that can lead to things like cancer, um, amongst other bad things. And, uh, yeah, so you would, you would basically be cooked at the same time. So you would become cooked spaghetti and then no one would ever see you again. So, bummer. Uh, but, let's see, other questions. Uh, what would happen if we got caught in a black hole? I just told you. Great. Fantastic. I'm ahead of things. Uh, how would it affect us if our moon was destroyed by a black hole? Um, so again, it, it really wouldn't unless it got close enough that uh, we were sort of unstably caught uh, within that black hole and then that could be sort of um, not so good. And let me point out um, how you get a black hole. So let me get rid of this here. Um, let me explain two concepts for to you in, in the process. So we have to figure out how a star works. So how does a star work in the first place? Well, you end up with a scenario where you have this sort of uh, this nebula, this cloud of gas and dust, and through mutual self-gravitation it starts to clump and sort of spin around itself, and uh, that's sort of uh, sort of crazy. It gets a little bit 
tighter, clumpier, clumpier. As it gets closer and closer, things heat up. And eventually, due to gravitational interactions, and eventually you get enough heat that a new star is formed, very bright. Uh, nuclear fusion ignites, and, and this star is formed. And it's the process, it's sort of this, this tempering between gravity pulling everything in very tight and radiation from the star pushing everything out. And so this process sort of tempers itself, and this is called hydrostatic equilibrium. Radiation pushing out, gravity pulling in. And stars hang out like that very nicely for a long time. The sun is in hydrostatic equilibrium. It will continue to be in hydrostatic equilibrium uh, for quite some time, and it will never lose hydrostatic equilibrium dramatically, rapidly, and that's very good because the sun is basically not big enough to explode. So that's very positive for us. Uh, the sun will die, uh, but not explosively, and that's a topic for another evening. So. We'll get to that later, maybe. Okay, so this is a, a neat visual that we put together for our planetarium shows, and this is something that you can check out uh, at the Intuitive Planetarium when we reopen. So on the flip side, that's how a star is born and how it works, um, but what happens when it dies? So if you have a star that's very massive, and uh, so massive that it cannot sustain all of this nuclear fusion, eventually you hit uh, fusing into heavier and heavier things like iron, and in a split second, once you fuse from hydrogen into helium into carbon into heavier things and you hit iron, then the star needs more energy than it is uh, releasing to continue this process. And so things become unstable, the core collapses on itself, and the star um, rips itself apart in the most violent uh, event in the universe, or one of them. And this is a supernova, and the process can leave behind this nice nebula, as you saw here, flying in. But it also, sometimes, if the star is massive enough, this core can literally collapse on itself so tightly with enough mass that a black hole can be formed. So this would be a stellar mass black hole. And that's what we can see right in here. So this is how uh, stars, or this is how stars become uh, black holes. Um, stellar, ma stellar mass black holes, meaning star-sized black holes. Um, the other type of black hole that you could have uh, would be an intermediate mass black hole, so that's maybe 50,000 to 100,000 times the mass of the Sun, instead of maybe, you know, 3 to 100 times the mass of the Sun. And then from there you get to supermassive black holes, which could, which could be millions, if not billions of times the mass of the sun. And so stellar mass black holes could be you know, strewn throughout um, our galaxy, other galaxies. Supermassive black holes uh, are typically thought to be at the center of uh, at least most, if not all, galaxies. And intermediate mass black holes were very, very um, unknown and still are very, very unknown. We haven't really directly observed one to, um, I guess, 100% assurance, but um, recent news says that we most likely saw one in a nearby galaxy, uh, so you can go to NASA's website to learn more about um, that and how the Hubble Space Telescope helped with that. And uh, basically the idea behind these intermediate mass black holes is that they are not something that we're going to find in an event of them forming, right? We're not going to see a star blow up and go supernova and then find a black hole in it instead. Um, we're also not going to see it rapidly consuming things like we see with supermassive black holes because it doesn't have the same gravitational pull as those. And so we have to get sort of lucky to find them. And so you can read more about that uh, if you so desire. Uh, I can post a link to that NASA article uh, after this in the comments. Uh, so other questions, what if a black hole entered a galaxy with nothing for it to swallow up? Would it stall out? Fantastic question. Uh, a black hole doesn't have to consume anything. It uh, can simply just be a region of space that is incredibly dense that nothing can escape. So it can still be this black hole in space uh, whether it's eating something or not. And most black holes probably aren't eating anything. They're just hanging out. And we don't know they're there until you get close and turn into uh, space spaghetti, as uh, Laura is talking to, or as Tyler is saying here. Um, but 
it, the likelihood of you hitting one of those is, is pretty slim, especially given um, how much we have, uh, we as humans have been traveling into space, and we would understand, we would be able to notice their gravitational influence on things, so we can say with quite good certainty that there's nothing um, of concern in our solar system or nearby neighborhood. Uh, so that's good. Um, let's see. So I think I've covered most of my topics. And Julie says, thank you for doing these. I'm sharing with other parents afterwards at Caddo Middle Magnet and Treeport. Fantastic. Um, I'm glad that even despite missing notifications, you figured out how to get here. And you can watch it again. So don't, don't fret whatsoever. This will be up on our Facebook page. And you can check it out. Uh, Aaron is related to the person who helped fix the Hubble Space um, Space Telescope, and that is fantastic. That was very much needed. Um, Hubble is celebrating its anniversary here soon, uh, 30th anniversary, and that's super, super exciting. Oh, lastly, last thing, nothing to do with black holes, but just very exciting. Uh, let me bring you to... Let me bring you to uh, what's going to happen here. Um, tonight, actually, something that you should look for, which is uh, a very nice sight in the sort of southern-ish sky. Let me bring you to... Let me bring over um, another tab. Let's see how nicely this will... This will handle it for me. Very cool. Okay, so uh, we're now using a different software. This is called Worldwide Telescope, and you can find it at worldwidetelescope.org. Uh, it's free to use and uh, very powerful, very exciting. Um, but, so if you are looking um, sort of, let's see, let me view from, okay. So if you're looking kind of southwest um, in the early evening tonight, you'll, you'll notice Orion. Uh, he is right in here, the hunter. Very, very bright trio of stars here that make up his belt, as well as Betelgeuse, one of the armpits, Rigel, one of the knees, Safe, another knee, Bellatrix, the other armpit. Um, so he's very, very bright, and the face of Taurus the bull is very bright as well, this sort of V-shape. And then the shoulder of Taurus, uh, heading a little bit more... Um, west and then into north. This is going to be uh, known as the Pleiades, or Subaru in Japanese, and these are the Seven Sisters. And if we zoom in, they're very, very pretty. They're very bright. It's a nice, uh, tightly knit young star cluster. Anyway, this is always something very exciting for you to check out, uh, but tonight Venus is going to be pretty well smack dab in it. Um, so you should check it out. It will be awesome. Uh, it will be worth you looking at, and if you say, oh no, maybe I won't see it tonight, um, maybe I'll go out the next night, that's a bad plan because it won't be there anymore, it'll be further. So so don't do that. Go out tonight, uh, and then go out the next night too, and let's face it, you should go outside a lot right now, um, at least in your yard, um, not too far away from your house, and uh, enjoy the outside, and enjoy the night sky because it's beautiful, and will give you some good peace. So with that said, uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I hope that I answered some of your black, uh, your black hole questions. If you have any other questions, feel free to post them in the comments, and I can give you some answers after the fact. And please join us again next week, uh, next Friday at 7 p.m. We will reveal the topic uh, next week as well at some point, as soon as I figure out what it's going to be. And again, keep in mind that this is Science Never Stops with the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. My name is David Weigel, and I hope you have a fantastic evening. So thank you so very much. <laughs>